Hello and welcome back to the Consistory the Calc YouTube channel. I'm your host for this video, Reverend Jake Zell with the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. Today we're going to be continuing on with our What It Means to Be a Lutheran Lecture series with part one, article four of the small called articles. And so in this one, Luther, in the last few videos, we've really much talked about like these mysteries of the Trinity because well, I thought it was appropriate at that time to take some time to discuss the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. So, first week we talk about the nature of the Trinity, then the second week we talked about the origins of the Trinity, last week we talked about the, you know, mystery of the Incarnation. Now, today we're up to the life and work of Jesus. And now, not to say that this is not something important to talk about, but this is really something that I've talked about quite a lot, particularly if you go back to the early videos in this lecture series that I did on the Apostles' Creed because Luther actually says here, after he's made this fourth statement, he says, as the Apostles and Athanasians' creeds and the common children catechisms teach. Here Luther pretty much, almost word for word, just quotes the second article of the Apostles' Creed. And I mean, there's some differences, but yeah, basically, if you really want a more in-depth, detailed, explanation on all these points, I would recommend going right back to my lectures on the creeds. They are going to more details. This video is going to be, as Luther was with the small court articles, a very quick one, run through. We will, at this one point, spend a bit of time on the topic of the Semper Virgo, because here, the first statement that Luther makes is that Jesus became a human being, and that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit without male participation and was born of the pure Holy Virgin Mary. So the first few things we get here is that as we teach in John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is God, and in John 1.14, that he took on flesh and dwelt among us. We also have the virgin birth mentioned in Isaiah 7.14, which is then quoted in Matthew 1.23, where the angel Gabriel is telling Joseph that Mary has not committed adultery and cheated on Joseph, but that the child inside of her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. To this, we can also add uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 35, where the angel Gabriel tells Mary she's going to conceive a child. She, in verse 34, says, how can this be? I'm just a virgin. And then the angel Gabriel, in verse 35, says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus is born by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no male sperm that produces him. Uh, as we teach in the Athanasian Creed, Jesus gets his entire human flesh, DNA, his human substance from the substance of his mother, Mary. That means that everything, Jesus' hair, skin, muscles, bones, blood, cells, all that stuff are from Mary. Jesus' DNA is Mary's DNA, except with one exception, Mary is a woman, so she has an X, X chromosome. Jesus is a man, so he has an X and a Y chromosome. Um, that's through the miracle of God's working. It's very similar to how with Adam and Eve, Eve is made out of Adam's ribs, so technically she would be a clone of Adam, had the same DNA as Adam, except that Mary, you know, Adam had an XY chromosome and Mary has two X chromosomes, and, you know, Jesus has... Uh, you know, the Virgin Mary has female anatomy, Jesus has male anatomy, Adam had male anatomy, and the Virgin Mary had female anatomy. This is, sorry, Eve had female anatomy. You very get much with the birth of Jesus, almost like a reverse of the creation of Eve, where from a woman, out of a man came a woman, and now out of a woman comes a man. But what is most interesting in this comment, and this is something that has sparked heaps of debates in Lutheran circles, is that Luther in the German version, refers to Mary as the pure, holy virgin, but in the Latin, he calls her the pure, ever virgin. And so, this raises the question about the Semper Virgo. Does this mean the Lutheran confessors teach a Semper Virgo? And for those who don't know, Semper Virgo is Latin for always virgin or ever virgin. The idea that Mary remained a virgin even after the birth of Jesus. Now, Scripture is not clear on this matter, and people can argue for and against it, and people have their arguments in both ways, you know. In the people who are against the Semper Virgo will say things like Jesus had brothers and sisters mentioned in Scripture, whereas those who are for Semper Virgo will say, yeah, but they don't necessarily have to be half-siblings born of Mary and Joseph. They could be step-siblings born from 
Joseph in a previous marriage, which is generally the early church tradition. There is also the argument that Jesus, um, that the word for siblings in Greek is, there's no real word for cousin in Greek. And so the word sibling can be used for either your actual biological siblings or for your close cousins. Um, I mean, one argument I've always thought of when it comes to the Semper Virgo is also that the idea is that Joseph the carpenter is meant to be the rightful heir to the throne of David. And so when he dies, that gets passed on to Joseph, who was legally considered the son of Jesus. If Jesus had half sibling, no, half sibling, if Jesus had step siblings from a previous marriage, then James, the oldest of those step siblings, would actually be the oldest firstborn son of Joseph, and he would be the rightful heir to the throne of David, not Jesus. So I think we should actually dismiss that argument because it seems to conflict with the idea of the genealogies in Matthew 1. The idea of either half siblings or cousins would be more the argument where we debate. There's also the idea that Jesus is called Mary's firstborn son. Some people say, ha, ah, they're sure Mary must have had other children. But that's not right. You, even if you only have one child, your first child is always still the firstborn child. The other argument for those who oppose Semper Virgo is the fact that in Matthew 1.25 it says that Joseph didn't know Mary until, until she had given birth to Jesus. But that again isn't necessarily meaning that they did have relations after the birth of Jesus. All it means is they didn't have relations before the birth of Jesus. Luther uses the example of the raven that Noah, that Noah releases from the ark. In Genesis 8, it says that Noah lets this raven go, and it says that it didn't come back until the ground had dried up. And Luther says, this doesn't mean that the raven then came back to Noah after the ground dried up. It just means that it didn't come back while the ground was still wet. See, Luther says, so thus, it doesn't necessarily mean that Joseph and Mary slept together after Jesus was born. It just means they didn't sleep together before Jesus was born. I mean, Luther uses the idea, he says, he believed that Mary remained a virgin because Mary, it said Mary was a virgin, and it never said she stopped being a virgin. Though, one could argue in the reverse that it also says Mary, you know, remained a virgin. So, it's an argument from silence. Now, there are some arguments for those in the pro-Semper Virgo camp, such as the idea that Mary's womb was consecrated by the birth of Jesus, and that we have in the Levitical law, and also mentioned again in the book of Acts, that that which is called holy by God, we are not to treat as common or as unclean. And so the argument there is that if Mary's womb was made holy with the conception of Jesus, that it would have been something holy and that Jesus and that Joseph wouldn't want to have, have treated it as just a common womb. Um, though the argument could be that in holy matrimony, the womb is consecrated for the sake of bearing children, and so it would have been permissible for Joseph to have relations with Mary and have more children. There's also the command to, you know, go forth and multiply, and that command would have applied to all married couples, including Mary and Joseph. So there's those arguments. There is the argument that the church fathers used, and the reformers believed this as well, that in Ezekiel 44.2, there is this prophecy about the city of Jerusalem. It talks about that God would go through the gate and close it and that none shall open it. Therefore, it will remain shut forever. And that the fathers and the reformers applied this to the Virgin Mary. That, and there's very much of an idea that, you know, in the Old Testament, Jerusalem is a symbol of the church. You also get this in Revelation. The New Jerusalem is a symbol of the church, but also in like Revelation 12, the woman, the Virgin Mary, is also a symbol of the church, and so that Jerusalem, the church, and Mary are all kind of connected as this one combined symbol, and so that which applies to Jerusalem applies to the church and applies to Mary. I mean, there's, it's, it's a somewhat of a complicated argument, but the fathers and reformers did believe that this applied to the Virgin Mary, that after Jesus passed through the womb, passed through her gate, he, he would close it and none would ever open it again. No one would enter through there where the Lord has entered through. It's, it's particularly that line that where the Lord has entered, none shall enter. So therefore it says if Jesus has passed through Mary's birth canal, Joseph is never allowed to go in there. Um, but what then is the position of the Lutherans in regard to Semper Virgo? 
Well, essentially, Luther and the Reformers all held to Semper Virgo. His pastor Magnus Sorensen of the Kyle said, Semper Virgo was the position of the Reformers and those who wrote the Book of Concord. It was their assumed position and they just assumed everyone else held to it. Luther says that those who question Semper Virgo are idiots and sometimes Luther really praises this doctrine to one point Luther calls it an article of faith. Though in other places Luther also calls it an open question. Particularly Luther says the church has left, left this alone and has not determined this. Elsewhere Luther says the church leads this to us and has not decided. And most importantly Luther in his writing on Jesus was born a Jew, Luther said that scripture does not quibble about or speak about the virginity of Mary after the birth of Jesus. He says that, you know, scripture simply says she was a virgin, so therefore Luther simply believes she stayed a virgin. But if anybody thought that Mary didn't remain a virgin, we shouldn't be afraid or worry about that. It's an open question. This is also the position of the early Lutherans after Luther. Johann Gerhard says that we are not to debate about this topic, and here he actually quotes the church father, Saint Basil, who said back in the 300s that, we must not debate about this subject, about whether Mary, you know, had sex after she was married to Joseph or whether she remained a virgin. And so the church fathers and the reformers left this as an open question. And so where do we come back to with this issue of Luther calling Mary Semper Virgo in the small court articles? Well, the answer to this is twofold. The first point is that Luther is not making a confessional statement here. He's making an honorific statement. Luther doesn't say, I believe and teach that Mary remained a virgin. He just says, oh, the Virgin Mary, he, was, he just goes, Jesus was born of the ever Virgin Mary. He's using it as an honorific title, something to praise the Virgin Mary. And this is confirmed by the second point I'm going to make, which is, if this was an important doctrinal confessional statement, Luther would have kept it in both translations of the Book of Concord. But the reality is, Luther called her ever virgin in the Latin, but called her pure virgin in the German. If this was such an important document, and that it was a confessional document that all Lutherans had to subscribe to, Luther would have kept it in both versions of the Book of Concord. But since Luther didn't, Therefore, we know that it is an open question. Whether you want to treat Mary as an ever-virgin or not an ever-virgin, that's up to you. Now, the rest of the article goes pretty much just as the creed goes, that Jesus suffered, died, and was buried, descended into hell, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God. And that is essentially that article. I mean... Like I said, I could sit here and I could go into much more detail about the idea that Jesus suffered, died, rose again. The most important thing I can say is that Jesus did it in your place. He died on the cross for your sins, to free you from your sins, to pay the debt that you owe, to win for you forgiveness. He descended into hell to declare victory over sin, death, and the devil, to declare victory over the power of hell and the power of Satan. Then he rose again from the dead for your justification. We get this in Romans 4.25, that Jesus died for our sins and rose for our justification. We get in 1 Timothy 3.16, that Jesus was justified in the spirit and that we have uh, church fathers like Gerhard, or church fathers, Lutheran fathers like Gerhard who taught that this idea that Jesus is justified is that in the resurrection, Jesus was justified by the Father and that he did this on your behalf, winning for you a justification. Uh, this really gets into the whole topic of objective and subjective justification. I've done videos on this topic, particularly go and look up my video about um, 1 Timothy 3.16 and objective justification. But essentially, like I said, if you want to go into greater, deeper detail on this particular article and all the points Luther makes, I would just recommend going back to the first few lectures in this lecture series when I get to the articles on the Creed, because on the Apostles' Creed I actually broke that into the traditional 12 parts so that we could go into a deep thorough dive into each of the points mentioned in the Creed. There I went through the whole, what's it mean to say that Jesus died? What's it mean to say Jesus descended into hell? What's it mean to say he rose from the dead? What's it mean to say that he ascended on high? I've gone into a lot of detail on that in my lectures on the Creed. So I'd point you there because right now I'd just be repeating myself. And the main point is that Luther doesn't go into much detail in this article. 
the articles that Luther starts going into more thorough details is part two, which we're going to pick up in our next video. We're going to talk about Small Court Articles Part 2, Article 1, which Luther calls the chief and first article, the Article of Justification. So we're going to discuss that in our next video. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.